There's lots of detail on these guys, and if you paint them to a, a lower level gaming standard, they just don't look good. But Infinity Armies are small, and we can justify spending a little extra time on these. In the case of this army, we're going to shoot for two hours or less per model. Let's do this. Now with armies, I always start by priming black, and with as much of the figure as assembled as is possible. My first rule is, if you can't see it, don't paint it. In the case of these Infinity models, they are completely assembled. Now you can airbrush this primer on with um, some Badger Steinal Res, or just use a rattle can. In this case, I used a rattle can. And seriously, be sure to give your primer at least 24 hours before painting it. And to make sure you didn't miss any spots, give you all the models a once over. Grab your trusty old number 8 hobby brush and some Steinal Res primer and stick it in all those spots you missed. I think the key to this is putting it on a little bit thick at first um, so that it covers the area you want to you wanna get painted. And then from there, kind of wipe, wipe the, the paint out into a further area. So it's almost like dry brushing after that. And basically this just helps you spread the paint out over a larger area. It doesn't obscure details or you leave brush marks, stuff like that. Um, this will give you a nice smooth coat and get all those pesky areas that didn't receive primer, some primer on it. There's absolutely nothing more annoying than getting halfway through the paint job and finding some areas that you missed the prime on. All right, a few things to remember when painting armies. The first thing is just paint, because nothing will get done if you're playing video games. The second is, whenever possible, use paint straight from the pot. It's way easier to remember the name of a paint color that you bought rather than some weird concoction that you made up on the fly. The third thing is, use an airbrush. And not just for the base coats. Use it all through the painting process. The fourth thing is keep track of your time. I can't tell you how important this is. This will keep you focused on the task at hand. And the fifth thing is paint everything to the same level. I know a lot of you want to paint your heroes to a higher level. I mean, I used to do the same thing. But guess what? It turned every, every army into a display piece. And that's not... That's just not conducive for actually finishing an army. If you paint everything to the same level, you're gonna get that army done and it's gonna look fantastic. All right, so our next step is color selection. And I used to be really bad at choosing colors. Who knows, maybe I still am. But um, I used to always try to be really unique with my color selection and um, the, the compliment I would constantly get time and time again was uh, your colors are really interesting. And I realized real quick that that was not a compliment that you wanted. That was just them being nice. My color selection was really weird. So I did a couple things. Um, the first thing is I went out and got a color wheel. Um, and I used the real color wheel from the realcolorwheel.com. Um, you can just go to their website, download it, print it out. Um, and it's really, really good because it has all the colors or a lot of colors to choose from. Um, more than just your typical color wheel. Um, this, this more mimics my, my selection of paints that I have at home and um, that way I can choose each particular paint, put it up to the color wheel, go, okay, it's right about here, um, that's the color that I'm using. This really helps when choosing complementary color. Um, now take red, for example. Now, there's multiple hues for red and the complementary color for red is not the same for all of them. While a warm red gets a more bluish teal, a cool red gets a more greenish teal. Depending on uh, which, you know, if you have a warmer red or a cooler red, um, that will change which color uh, contrasts that color. So um, it's very important to choose your colors uh, specifically by the color. Um, that will help you a lot in making sure that your colors complement each other. Now, the color wheel can be confusing. At least it was for me. I mean, you have triads, complementary, split complementary, tetrads, I mean, all these different combinations of colors that you can use. A lot of times I would choose colors directly from the color wheel and it still wouldn't work. Let's look at an example here. The triad has three colors equal distance from each other on the color wheel. These colors will technically look good together. The problem is if all these colors are at full saturation, they're going to compete against each other. This is a huge problem. We cannot have competition between the colors. This will make your eyes not happy at all. When choosing colors for an army or even a single display model, when it comes to the colors, we have to have a clear winner. I found that for armies to really pop on the battlefield, you have to have at least one highly saturated color. Now the other colors need to be desaturated by adding white 
black, gray, or a complementary color. The one thing you can do um, if you must have multiple saturated colors is make sure that that other color occupies a much smaller space. So with our Onyx Contact Force, um, our main colors are red and black and white, um, which makes it really easy for finding which, uh, which is the saturated color in our color scheme. Obviously it's red, but a complementary color to that shade of red will be a bluish teal. Now we can incorporate this into the black armor, making uh, like say coal, adding coal black to our armor for highlights, um, as well as some bluish tones as we bring up even higher highlights. Um, same with our white armor. Um, we're going to add bluish gray tones to that and this will all make for a very pleasing color scheme. Now, we may add uh, more colors later on in the color scheme. I've got some OSL ideas I want to do and all that, which we will use color theory for as well. But for now, with our black, red, and white color scheme, we know we have a color scheme that will work. And we've got several different kinds of contrast going on. We've got light, dark. We've got warm and cool. And we've got desaturated and saturated. Now, these are the things that make you uh, really want to pay attention to the Army. Now, if you're having a problem uh, getting an area to be noticed, um, like the main color scheme or whatever, um, try adding more saturation to your color. We want that saturation to grab your attention and hold on. Whereas the desaturated parts of the army, they're there, but I want you to forget about them. I'm controlling what you look at in the army. All right, let's get started with the initial airbrushing. Here's the colors we use today. From Formula P3, we have coal black, Sanguine Base, Sanguine Highlight, and Kidor Red Base. From Citadel, we'll be using Rust Gray and Fenrisian Gray. So these are my base coats, and I need them to cover very quickly. So I'm going to be running these paints fairly thick through my airbrush. In fact, I want them to be just thin enough to go through my airbrush. I'll be using my Patriot 105 today at 40 PSI, and for the two Citadel colors, the Rush Gray and the Fenrisian Gray, we'll be running at about a 40% thinning solution to 60% paint. On the other hand, for the P3 paint, since they're a little thinner consistency right out of the pot, we'll be running at about 20% thinner to 80% paint. As always, I test the thickness of the paint by wiping the brush off on the side of the cup. If the paint stays on top, it's too thick. If the bristles cut through the paint, it's just right. Now let's get started with those shadows. I'll take my business card again. You can see those are the sprays that I'm putting down. That's about the thickness of the paint. Whereas like that's, that's more solid like that. So these little sprays like that, that's, that's the, the consistency I'm putting down. Okay, a good exercise to practice while airbrushing is to see if you can control the amount of paint that's coming out. So get a white piece of paper and try to spray like 10%, 20%, 30%. Um, get real good at spraying just a small amount out and kind of controlling how much of that small amount you want. This will help you big time have control over your shadows and your highlights. So you see how I can get different shades of this color. By spraying on evenly like this, I can start getting different, um, different shades of my shadow color even. Now remember, we've got black showing through this, so it'll actually look like over here on the black side of the sheet. So depending on how much you put on, that's how much shadow color you'll have. All right. So the first thing we want to do is uh, spray in our shadows. We're using coal black from Privateer Press. Uh, and we're going to come in from a really hard angle. And why are we using coal black in our shadows? Well, funny you should ask. Putting blues into a dark shadow color will actually make it look darker. It's kind of an optical illusion that happens with our vision. You've probably noticed that I'm always adding blues into my shadows. We're also going to be spraying our shadows from directly below the model all the way up to about 90 degrees. This will give us a good foundation on our shadow colors. Come in from a really hard angle like this and spray the nether regions, uh, all the lower areas of the model. Um, anything that you think would be in shadow. So, biscuit. I missed a spot. See, this is why, this is why it's good to leave that primer out, just in case. And then I'm going to come up to about uh, 90 degrees, like this. 
and I'm gonna hit everything with the shadow at 90 degrees. The reason for this is I don't I, I don't want when my uh, mid-tone colors are what it's actually going to be mostly highlight colors that are going to go on top of this because this guy's going to be black. When those go on, I don't want there to be blue, then black, then the color. So if I come in at 90 degrees, I can kind of hit just a little bit. And that way I keep myself from having problems later on. And I'm spraying in different intensities. Uh, maybe a little more intense as I get higher up on the model because I want it to be a little brighter. But always make sure to get in and around the head for sure. Back of that. All right. Also, don't forget to hit these guns, even though they're going to be a little bit different color. Um, I like setting up my lighting on them as well. You're always setting things up for future, future painting. This is how I typically clean out my airbrush. A few squirts, spray it, make sure that spray is good. Um, make sure it looks just like it does when it was brand new. That is a good, nice cone of spray. Uh, make sure it's not doing undulating in and out like that because that will tell you that it's, it's clogging a little bit. So it looks like we're pretty good. Um, I'll take my needle out. And we're good to go. Make sure we get all that dark color out. This is about what I'm spraying at. That little bit of paint. You can see here in the pot, that's my color. It's, it's a fairly light color. Um, but on the model, since we only sprayed at about 10%, it looks really dark, just like that. If we had gone more, we got more of that color, and that's not a color that we want. And what I'm gonna do, um, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna scrape off the tip of my airbrush, get that dry tip off, spray a little air to make sure there's no paint on there to flick off. And on this, we're gonna do a general lighting all the way around at about uh, 45 degrees and what this will do is it will kind of give us a little bit lighter color not too much though don't go overboard on this so I'm holding my brush back uh, normally I keep my brush close like this but I'm holding my brush back about six or seven inches and I'm just gonna spray lightly um, you can already see that changing the color just slightly and that's what we want We were out further away, now we're coming in closer. I'm gonna hit just a couple spots. I'm gonna hit up on his shoulder. Um, and his chest a little bit, just like that. A little bit on the knee. Um, on his gun. On that side of the shoulder pad, the top of this, his backpack. Uh, on the back side of the model, we need to create a secondary light source. So um, I'm going to do it right on this side of the backpack, a little brighter on the shoulder pad, the elbow, the top of the back of that leg, and the top, very top of that leg. We do a little bit up here. Like that. On the back of his elbow, back of that leg a little bit. I think that works. 
just do the just do the top of the gun for now. Perfect. Again, checking our spray, looks good. See that? That's not even a factor. We fix that problem with a little bit of beeswax. And we're good to go. So check out my cup. There's still paint inside the cup. Um, it's still kind of semi-wet. Uh, I usually just leave it because the next color, if it mixes in a little bit, it's okay. I think that works out perfectly. Um, I used to take a brush and, and wipe that out between each uh, color change, but I noticed that I clogged a lot. And I think what happens is uh, the, the paint comes off in sheets of semi-dried paint, and then it goes down to the bottom of your airbrush and goes right out your nozzle. So um, if you really need to get it out, uh, just take a paper towel and wipe it out like that. Wipe it out as best it can. So our next color looks like this. It's Fenrisian Gray. And some of the other colors in there, I'm just gonna leave them in there because they're not gonna hurt anything. Um, spray it out a little bit, make sure that the paint's going through. Uh, and on this, we're gonna get a little more focused with where our light's coming from. So you have to choose with each model which side the light's coming from, or I like to choose a directional light. Light from straight above is a little bit boring. Um, I like, you know, sort of movie light or party light. <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Um, 
So I always have my white light coming a little bit from the left hand side or the right hand side, depending on the the pose of the character. So like this guy, I think would look good with the with the light right here, whereas um, some of the other characters maybe it look better from the other side. Um, I've always wondered. Uh, well, I used to always worry that on an army, all the lights should be coming from the same direction, but I don't think it matters. Um, all the models are gonna be in different directions on the table, so it really doesn't matter how the lighting's set up. Um, it looks cool either way. So on this guy, his light's gonna be right over here. So we're gonna go, instead of from a 45 degree angle, we're gonna go from a little bit higher degree angle, maybe a 90 degree. Um, now, this is black armor, so we don't wanna go too bright. We're just gonna go a little bit lighter than what it already is. Again, we're gonna use our 10% rule. So we're gonna go right about that much. Maybe a little brighter, we'll see what happens. So we're gonna go uh, brighter in the front because this is our, our primary light source. And then in the back, our primary light source is on this side. So we're gonna, we're gonna put it in, but just a little bit lighter. It's not gonna be quite as bright. The other thing to remember is uh, later on, these shoulder pads might get some red on them or the helmet's gonna be red, um, but it doesn't, it just doesn't matter right now. I wanna paint all my lights in so that I at least know how the lighting should go on the entire model. Now, yeah, and you, now I have my reading glasses on too, and this really helps me because I can get up close and, uh, and actually see what's going on. See the subtle change in color. Whereas if I don't have them on, it might, it might be too bright. Oh, and see we got our little dry tipping. I'm always uh, cleaning that off. Um, so once that happens, just make sure that you don't pull back too far because you have to pull back further as that dry tip gets drier and drier. So now, perfect, I can see the light coming on there. Uh, this shoulder pad is going to get hit right about there because that's where the light's hitting. The closer I get, the brighter it'll be. So I want a little bit of light on top of this arm pad right here. Top of that backpack thing. I think his gun's going to be a little bit different color later, but we might as well put the lighting in there just so that we know what it looks like, how it'll, the dynamic it will have with the rest of the parts. That, uh, went. And notice, I have not moved the model at all, so I'm keeping that light source. My hand is in the same position, my light source is in the same position. The only time you may have to change a little bit is if you physically can't get the airbrush, like if the part of the model will uh, obstruct the area, then you have to kind of bring your airbrush down a little bit. So you see it just builds up real slightly. Okay, now we're gonna have to move the model because um, I can't get to the other parts. So I'm gonna move the model a little like this. We see that the knee pad under there See it right there? So we're gonna hit, I'm gonna have to go under this weapon right here and just lightly spray it. See how that popped it up? That looks good. Sweet. Uh, maybe on his uh, cod piece here. These nuts. All right, and then our, our secondary light source is back here. So we're gonna have to hit it on the top of the shoulder pad again. But again, it's not gonna be as bright as the one in front, just a little bit less. Uh, we'll check our dry tip again. I, this is seriously exactly how I do it, not just for the video. I'm always checking that dry tip. Uh, we'll do the top of this leg just a little bit. And you see, I'm, I'm staying real close to the model. Like I'm literally about half an inch away from the model. Um, and that is because I don't want to, I want the, I want the light to be more focused. Again, we'll look on this. If I'm a half inch away from this business card, 
it makes it makes a little dot right there. If I'm further away, it makes a more spread out uh, blend. So I want I want this to be very right on top of it. I want it to be very focused because with this black armor, I don't want my highlights to go to cascade down too far. Otherwise, it'll be gray armor. Okay, anything you mess up on in this at this stage can be fixed later. So don't freak out too much. Um, get those little areas of detail down there. That looks super good. See how once you get the airbrush on there, it really comes to life. See the back of this elbow. Sometimes when I spray, nothing comes out, and that's okay. Uh, I want it to be the exact amount that I want it to be. So I'm pulling back slowly. Um, uh, remember in the tank video, uh, I was drawing little lines, and I was I couldn't see where it actually hit the model. Um, it's kind of the same thing with this. I'm spraying, and I don't really know if anything's coming out, um, but eventually it does. Eventually I see it either the model gets a little bit wet, um, or every time you're doing something real subtle like that, clean your dry tip off so you're not clogged. And right now I'm picking out little things that I think might be a little bit uh, more interesting if they were highlighted. So like maybe down at the bottom of the shoe. That bolt. Little things like that. You don't need to do everything, but uh, right on top of that elbow. I'm going to set up my lighting for this knife as well. I want the light to be towards the top, and then maybe at the bottom there'll be some blood or something. So, uh, again, I come in at a really high angle. Basically, my angles are setting up any shadows and highlights that I want to be made by the airbrush. The airbrush doesn't lie. It's shooting light it's shooting uh paint in a straight direction so um it behaves just like light
All right, so we got our airbrushing done, and um, now we're gonna start base coating the model, start uh, getting some different colors on, and blocking out some different areas. Um, the way I do this on armies, um, to keep my speed up and to keep my production flow going at a consistent rate, um, I try not to hold the model for more than 10 seconds. Um, and if I can, less than five seconds, because this is it's very important that, um, that you always feel like you're finishing something. So we have several areas that need black. So um, I know that all the stomach areas are gonna get uh, blacked out. And can't see it, don't paint it. So the nice thing is if there's an area on the model that um, you need to do and then it's for whatever reason that you can't reach it or you, that it doesn't have that particular part, um, you just do nothing. You set the model back down. So that's my favorite model to paint because I don't have to do anything extra. Remember, these are gaming models. We're trying to stay at under two hours. Um, you know, faster even if you can. Depends on what level you want. I want these to be fairly uh, well painted, so. Okay, this guy. This guy's our leader, so it might it might hold him for a little bit longer than the other guys. That's okay. But we want on in on average we want to be fairly quick between our different colors. So I'm gonna paint him black because I don't know what to do. And I tell you to just make decisions. So this black will look really cool because it will be it'll be dark. Um, and you've got some red armor elements around it. I think that will look really good next to each other. We can leave his shoes red. It'd be like Wizard of Oz Dorothy shoes. There we go. And I think I want his, his um, helmet to be black too. like his soul so I'm already getting a little bit excited about these guys they're starting to look kind of cool and um, and if I get excited about a model that's usually when I start really pushing and, um, and wanting to finish it up and so that is, those are all good things that's a that's a good spot to be in So like on something like this, I might only do the first half of this. Or maybe the bottom side. So I think you're finally getting the process. I'm taking each individual section of the model and um, breaking it down into smaller sections and then painting those smaller sections on each model one at a time. So that keeps me at a, at a quick pace. I'm only touching the model for five, maybe 10 seconds tops. Um, and that will keep me painting very quickly. What I find is if I choose to base coat the entire model, like paint all the sections that need to be black on each model, that way it will take me maybe 10 minutes on the first model but then the second model it takes 12 or 13 minutes and the third model it might take 15 minutes after a while it's taking like half an hour on each model and i don't know why that is but you just i think you're you just get bored um and so you you just naturally slow down um 
to keep up your pace, always be putting those models down. Just touch a little bitty spot. And like I said before, uh, my favorite model is the model where I pick them up and I don't paint them at all. I just set them back down. Uh, so we're painting the whole thing at once rather than one little part at a time. And this is good because if you're painting for yourself, it doesn't matter as much um, because it's for you. But if you have a customer and you're a commission painter, which I know a lot of you are, um, uh, how do you give a model to a customer that the bottom half is painted better than the top half? You can't do that. So what I found is if I paint the whole model kind of at once, um, then when I start running out of time, like, you know, if this is a, if this is our, my base level model and it's a one hour paint job, um, when I get close to the hour, at least the whole model's painted and I can be like, okay, let's focus on the face the last 15 minutes or something and let's, you know, make it look good. Um, but if you've only got the bottom half of the model painted and it's painted really fantastically because you spent all your time on that and then you get to the top and you only have 15 minutes left, what's going to happen is you're going to have to go over time. Now, that doesn't seem so bad, you know, if you just spend an extra 15 minutes on a model or even an hour, it's not, it's not a big deal, right? Well, when I painted um, the first Zombicide Kickstarter, I painted 17 sets of Zombicide for people. And I found out real quick that if I just went 15 minutes over on each zombie, um, it would have been four months of work for free at the end. So that kind of, you know, if you put, if you look, if you stand back and look at it with the big picture, um, it definitely makes sense to allocate your time correctly. And, um, you know, and, and plus it's, it's fair to your customers. Um, you know, if you, if you, if you do one paint job and it's, it's super high end and you charged a low end paint price for it, but then you're like, Oh, well, I don't want to do that anymore. And then you charge the next guy the same amount and paint it lower, which is what it should be. Um, they're not going to be happy. So you want to kind of keep everything even and you want to be fair to your customers and, and uh, you know, you have an obligation to do that. Uh, and so that's, that's the way, that's the way I do it. And that's the way I've been successful. So I keep everything at the same level. Um, stuff like that. Okay. What does this lady have? Nada. Nada. Another thing I found that keeps the pace up is just when you're getting sick of painting the same foot over and over and over again, um, switch things up. Either change colors altogether or in this case I picked up the drone remotes and they're a little bit bigger models and I wasn't quite sure which parts I needed to base coat black so I just base coated each one of those entirely. This mixes things up, keeps my head right, keeps me going fast. So sometimes when you're tying up those last few loose ends, just look around the model and, and do it because some of these models don't have these parts, so um, they're not going to have anything. Like these guys, they don't have anything on the front. They don't have anything on the back. Good to go. So they're done. Same with this guy. They do have a couple little tubes, but I'm going to save those for later. I don't know how I'm going to paint those tubes. All right, we got our black base coat on, and let's take a closer look at what we actually did. So we're taking a look here at our sample model. We've got a red helmet. Um, we've got a little bit of areas of red around here. Um, both of those I base coated in black. Um, the chest piece is going to be in white, and I did not base coat that, that in black because that'll be the next step. Um, <clears throat> We got a little bit of red here. There's a couple of little spots of red around the rest of the body. Um, obviously the black in the legs, um, the guns, which will be a different shade of black. Um, so you see, it's pretty, pretty simple. Um, black down in here, black in the, in the joints. Um, pretty simple color scheme, but it looks good. So we're going to start doing a little bit of highlighting. Um, so we're going to take our, our Fenrisian Gray, straight out of low cash. And um, basically we're going to start doing some edge highlighting and a little bit, we're going to blotch in a little bit of color. 
Um, but basically I just want to get some colors on the model um, so we can see how the highlights go. So again, we're only going to hold apart for a certain amount of time. Um, just a few seconds for each one. So I'm just going to put a highlight across there, a line down there. So let's do that on every single model. Uh, for this one. Kind of like that. Our light is coming from this direction on this guy. So it's going to hit higher up on here. Um, I'm going to put a little blotch of light right at the top here. Right up here. And I'm not going to worry about it about blending it or anything. I just kind of want a circle of light and make sure the edges are not perfect. So we'll fix that later. Uh, maybe even like sort of dot it in, stipple it in a little bit. Um, I also noticed this part right here has got to be black because um, it will eventually be red. So I'm just going to black it out real quick. Um, and I'll do the rest of them off cam so you don't have to watch me do that. But just so as he knows, I missed a spot. So we made our, we made our highlight right there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do all the highlights up here. Uh, show you how I do that and then how I... Uh, Sort of tie it all together with the airbrush afterwards. So we'll get that. Um, I think this light's coming up here, so this is going to be bright up towards the top. And sort of taper off as it goes down. Um, this is going to have a highlight real big circle right there. Uh, there'll be little glimmers on the bottoms of these things. Notice I don't go all the way around because that looks weird. Um, and then I want to put an edge highlight right at the top here. Like that maybe it'll start coming down like that. So it kind of just abruptly ends there, but I'm okay with that because I'm going to spray it with the airbrush. So. I don't have to worry about that. Um, this would get a little bit right there. And this is kind of shiny metal, so it will reflect upside down. Cool. Um, and then maybe if we want, we can add a little bit of white into our mix. And put that right here just to kind of bling it out, like pop that. Some right up there, right in the center of this thing. Highlight, highlight, highlight. Bring those spots out, that looks cool. Um, this would be getting hit with that really bright light, the brightest right there, so we'll put it right there. Um, maybe we'll put, add that secondary highlight up here, and where it turns. And I'll put that also over here. Alright. So those are my little highlights. So I've got my mixture, it's pretty thinned out. As you can see, it's really, really light. I mean, it was the same color as over here, but now it's very light and that's because it's it's very thinned out. Um, so I get up real close, I got my reading glasses on and I'm gonna spray little sprays of this until my crappy blend there goes away. But what will stay is that highlight. 
Now, if nothing happens, that means you thin your paint too much. Um, whoa. So that went a little bit big. That's okay. Um, now, I can always come back while I got my airbrush out. And just kind of tidy this up. And that's how you work with both your airbrush and your paintbrush in conjunction with each other. Um, it goes really, really quick because you're not worried about putting 85,000 layers of paint on to achieve a smooth blend. You just put paint on and then you, you smooth it out. is 100% white, titanium white. And again, if it ends up a little bit too choppy, you just come back with your airbrush and fix that. Now I've got super strong highlights there. I can smooth this blend out. A little bit more. I almost licked my airbrush. That would have been, that would have been super weird. Just smooth it out. Boom. All right. So. Let's start uh, doing these highlights.
All right, folks, now that's a wrap for our first video on painting the Onyx Contact Force from Infinity. Now in this first video, we finished highlighting the black armor for the entire squad. Now you might be asking yourself, that looks a little bit bright, doesn't it? Well, yes it does, and we're going to fix that in the next video. Now why did I choose to paint the black armor first? Well, you guessed it, it takes the longest to do. Another one of the tricks I use is to do the hardest, most time-intensive step first. That way, the rest of the job is all downhill. Oh, and if you're wondering, we're currently about 12 hours into the paint time. That includes cleaning, assembly, priming, and you guessed it, all the painting that was in this video. So that means that we've used half of our time budget per model. We've got one hour to finish each model, so I think we're looking pretty good at this point. So what have we learned today? One, if you don't paint, absolutely nothing gets done. Two, be sure to use an airbrush when painting armies. It speeds things up immensely. Number three, keep yourself accountable by keeping track of your time. Number four, Paint every model in the army to the exact same level. Number five, use a color wheel to help you choose your colors for the army. Number six, we learned that using saturated colors can not only add a uh, body to the paint job, but it can give you a much needed pop on the battlefield. Number seven, we did some exercises to control how much paint comes out of our airbrush. Number eight, we found out that we definitely need to check that dry tip on our airbrush constantly. We learned that by spraying at different angles, we can mimic the way light hits the model. Number 10! We learned that for production line base coating, um, holding the model for five, maybe 10 seconds tops is key to keeping up a good pace. Number 11. We got some great tips on how to do airbrush blending on a 28 millimeter figure. Once again, thank you all for being part of the Miniature Monthly team. We couldn't do this without you. So like they say, until next time, go paint something. Oh, and if you're wondering, I totally forgot to put the footage of the, the Red Leader being airbrushed, space coated. So uh, you can watch that now.